everyone. I think we are live. I uh, just want to verify that real quick on our page. Thank you all for joining us again tonight for our regular Thursday evening program uh, at the Adams County Historical Society. Uh, if you're not familiar with the society, we are the Community Archives in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We preserve over a million historic items uh, from all eras of, of history back to dinosaur footprints, uh, through to the Eisenhower era and beyond. Um, and I'm really thrilled tonight to be joined by uh, a couple of my, my very favorite historians, uh, Tim Smith, uh, the historian and collections manager at the Adams County Historical Society, and Gary Edelman, who is the chief historian at the American Battlefield Trust. And we are thrilled to be talking about a uh, really big discovery that was made um, in the last few months that we were uh, happy to share with all of you over the past few days. And that is the presence of an exceptionally rare a Civil War map. Um, it's a map of the battlefield of Antietam drawn by a uh, kind of uh, notorious and um, mysterious map maker named Simon G. Elliott. Um, and uh, the map has kind of made some waves in the historical community. Uh, and we're here to talk with Tim and Gary about that. And then we'll get into some more details uh, about uh, the map maker and what we now know about the Gettysburg battlefield. Um, but we've learned about Elliot and his work here at Gettysburg as well as Antietam. I also wanted to just briefly thank, we have an anonymous donor here tonight who's matching donations up to $158, 158 years since the Battle of Antietam and the match is $158. So please feel uh, free to hit the donate button and help us out as we work to continue to preserve all this important history. Um, so without further ado, um, let me just take a few seconds to explain how we came to discover this map, and then I want to turn it over to our historians here uh, to talk about what they uh, felt and heard and uh, <laughs> their interactions with others uh, once the map was discovered. Um, so really all of this began when we, we started looking into the history of the map maker, Simon G. Elliott. Uh, we, we figured out his identity. Uh, we were able to trace him and his movements when he was in Gettysburg and Antietam in 1864. Um, and so in the course of putting together this research, I asked my colleague, Tim Smith of the Adams County Historical Society uh, to look into whether or not there were other Elliott maps around in, in digital repositories. Uh, so Tim checked several uh, institutions and in their online catalogs um, and ended up uh, searching the catalog of the New York Public Library in New York City. Um, and when he was searching that catalog, uh, he uncovered something pretty remarkable. Uh, a map drawn by Elliot, not of Gettysburg, but of Antietam, showing thousands of temporary burials on the Antietam battlefield, um, men buried in shallow graves where they fell. Uh, so Tim, what was your first uh, reaction uh, when you first uh, came across this incredible resource? Well, you know, when I was on the website and I had been, I was searching for a Gettysburg map, I downloaded the map you know, I, I guess I didn't really look at what their uh, thumbnail of it was or read the description. And I was waiting for it to download. So when it appeared, I could, uh, you know, figure out it, what version of this Elliott map it was. And we'll talk about it later. There are like three different versions. And when I opened up the file, I saw the Hagerstown Road. And I thought, well, you know, I'm way up, you know, south and west of the battle kid. So I started to drag it across. And I couldn't get my bearings at all. And then I saw the Hagerstown Pike and I saw the Smoketown Road and, and I knew it was the Elliott burial map because it had these little squiggly lines on it for the burials of horses and the regular crosses for the Union soldiers and the slash marks for the Southern soldiers. And I, I'd say it took 10 or 15 seconds for, for me to actually process that this was an Elliott burial map of the Antietam battlefield and the reason that of course it was difficult for me to process it was because, you know, I know a little bit about Antietam and I know that this map had not been uh, seen by Antietam scholars or historians, that this was something new, that this was something very unique. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I think so, Gary, uh, in terms of preservation of the battlefield, could you explain uh, for especially the Historical Society audience uh, what the American Battle Trust does and all the important work that you've already done at Antietam to keep some of this land that we now have an incredible resource showing uh, to keep that land safe? Well, I would love to, Andrew. Thank you very much. Uh, the American Battlefield Trust uh, preserves uh, hallowed ground, key battlegrounds from the Revolutionary War, uh, the War of 1812, and the American Civil War, and we educate the public about these conflicts and why it matters today. 
Um, you know, we, we were born of a civil war organization, but uh, you know, the federal government asked us to get into these other wars and, uh, and we did. And this is why we have the American Battlefield Trust nowadays, not simply the Civil War Trust. And what we're always trying to do is a few things. One, battlefields matter. What happened on them, they are different than other ground. This is one of the reasons actually why we focus just on the hallowed ground where in our opinion, uh, a lot of the final decisions were made that ultimately made this country what it is today. You can make a good argument that politicians um, and, and, and others made important decisions in courthouses and in Congress. They absolutely did. But the ultimate decisions were made on battlefields. Can anybody think um, that uh, America gains independence from Britons without military victories on battlefields. This is the same thing for the Emancipation Proclamation, and it is the same thing of why the Union remained as a Union at the end of the Civil War's greatest test. So we feel these battlefields are very important. And this map, if I may, Andrew, just is one of the great tools we could have to demonstrate graphically in yet another way, and a particularly disturbing and telling way why this land is different. It's one thing to, you know, tell somebody what happened there. And some people might resonate, that might resonate with some. It's another thing to sort of see a picture of the dead in black and white um, in front of you and whatnot. But it's another to see a whole battlefield with thousands of hash marks for Union and Confederate soldiers and the terrible toll on horses as well. So it is an incredibly powerful tool to convey to people in one graphic way exactly how this ground is hallowed. It is literally hallowed. Right, right. And I did want to also show, I think we, we have a, a graphic here that actually illustrates the land that has been preserved uh, by the American Battlefield Trust um, that is uh, on actually imposed onto the Elliott burial map showing the specific graves around the battlefield um, on land that is now safe. Um, so we encourage all of our supporters to also join the American Battlefield Trust in their work to keep these, uh, these battlefields protected. And we, we really um, appreciate the work that they've done here in Gettysburg as well to keep, uh, keep things safe and, and, uh, um, and, and historic. Uh, so um, any other thoughts, Gary? Uh, so um, it, when, with this map and, and the way that it's going to be interpreted now by uh, future historians, how do you think that this map uh, plays into our understanding of of what an at the aftermath of a civil war battle looked and felt like for, for communities like Sharpsburg and Gettysburg? Well, I, I think the key is that we've been doing this, we've been using, we meaning the historical community, this could mean a lot of different people, have been using the Gettysburg Elliott map for so long now, and now we have this one for Antietam. And what I think the biggest thing is, I can't wait for the weeks, months, and years to come um, where historians start to answer some of the questions, the myriad questions we all have now. Uh, you know, I am absolutely baffled why there are so many hash marks in certain areas where Gardner's photographs, Alexander Gardner taking photos of Antietam right after the battle, why do his photographs show certain, uh, you know, undulations where the dead are buried, but where there's another 50 hash marks, none. Um, why is it that there are, you know, certain farm lanes and certain breastworks, breastworks at Antietam in 1862? Is he taking the 1864 battlefields he's read about and interposing them onto the Antietam battlefield? Um, I'm not so sure about that. It's questions like this. And who are these men? Um, how is it that we can come as close as possible to doing the best we can to honor them? Um, you know, North and South, these are husbands, brothers, and sons, and we might not be able to identify most of the graves, but we can maybe tell what unit they're in. And if we can tell what unit they're in, and if those unit, that unit only lost so many dead in a hospital we know was miles away, um, maybe just knowing that dead from that unit, we can narrow it down to 30 or 40 people, and that's the best we can do. But this is a precious resource, like the photography, like the key other primary sources. We have to use it to the fullest. So I think it's almost endless what we will do with this new source. Right. That's great. Thank you, Gary. And uh, we so appreciate being able to share this discovery with you all. And um, if you haven't already checked it out, there is an article in the Washington Post. Uh, it was uh, on their website, I believe, yesterday morning. Um, and uh, you can check it out and read a little bit more uh, about what they had to say, as well as uh, some other media outlets that have picked it up. And so we're excited to to keep uh, sharing this with as many people as we can. <laughs> yeah, and, and let me, I, I think you know, I'm gonna jump off um, in a second, but I just wanna say that I'm, the American Battlefield Trust is very grateful to the Adams County Historical Society. You all 
located and knew the significance of this document. The trust had nothing to do with locating, discovering, unearthing this document at the New York Public Library. And you let us you know, help with the release of this important announcement. Um, it's something we're pretty good at, but you didn't have to. And we and all the members of the trust um, appreciate it. And um, to all the trust members watching, check out the Adams County Historical Society, excellent organization. We partner with them all the time on special tours um, and whatnot. And it's just, first rate, and we hope you'll support them as well. And of course, thank you all, uh, Andrew, Tim, and everybody watching for supporting Battlefield Preservation. This isn't the end of the video. I'm just leaving. <laughs> thank you, Gary. Thank Great you, to everyone. See you. Have a good night. <laughs> you too. All right. Very good. So now um, we're going to get into a little bit more of uh, the, the meat of, of our project and, and talk about what we've learned about these maps. And uh, we are the Adams County Historical Society, so we're interested in, in things like farms on the battlefield, um, in uh, the, how the town of Gettysburg is shown on the map, how the layout of the National Cemetery is portrayed. Uh, we, we look into these small details and they can tell us just volumes about the battle. But what we've learned is that the Elliott map, in fact, is maybe an even greater resource than we had imagined. Um, and that's because Elliott, the map maker himself, um, was relying on prior surveys of the battlefield that were done within just weeks of the fighting uh, ending. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Tim uh, in, a, in a second here just to kind of set up um, the Elliott map in terms of what was happening in Gettysburg um, in the weeks and months after the battle, the devastation that the community uh, suffered, um, and how uh, the process of cleaning up and, and organizing a national cemetery, this massive effort to move all of these Union burials uh, to one place, um, how exactly that took place. And then we'll get into um, how you know, these maps uh, have helped us even better understand the process. Well, you know, the story of the National Cemetery is pretty simple. There were thousands of soldiers that were killed in the fighting. You know, a lot of people hear that there are 51,000 casualties at the battle, and people assume that that means 51,000 dead. No, there were 50,000 men killed or wounded or captured or missing. We're not sure how many men died during the actual battle, but I would guess in the uh, range of 5,000. But then in the days and weeks after the battle, more soldiers died in and around the town in the large hospitals. And then of course, people were transported as far away as Philadelphia and Baltimore and Harrisburg and people died in hospitals in other cities that, as a result of their wounds from the battle. So we're not exactly sure if you try to pin us down how many men were killed or wounded during the battle. And there's various uh, you know, approximations from seven to 10,000, depending on where you count and how you stop counting who actually died or was mortally wounded. But uh, you know, in the area of the battlefield itself, uh, soldiers that were buried. Um, uh, I think the Elliott burial map, what did we say, Andrew, has 8,000 slash yeah. marks on it? Over 8,000, yep. So, um, and of course, we're not sure about the exact accuracy of some of the positions they put in there. But, you know, let's just say, um, you know, there's 10,000 men that died during the battle or more to be wounded or, you know, uh, over 20,000, 5,000 wounded. Uh, you know, it's the dead uh, outnumber the townspeople like five to one. And, you know, the wounded outnumber the townspeople, you know, um, 10 to one. Uh, so it's a pretty, it's pretty dramatic, the numbers uh, of the, you know, the people who were here in the town afterwards and the, the aftermath of the battle is just overwhelming for the people. Now we do have photographs that were recorded after the battle by various cameramen who arrived, arrived here like Alexander Gardner, uh, Matthew Brady and his crew, Frederick Gutekunst, and Alexander Gardner and his crew actually arrived much like at Antietam before the bodies were buried and took photographs of the dead on the field. We also have eyewitness accounts from newspaper reporters immediately after the battle who are going around the battlefield and describing what it's like. And of course, later we have civilian accounts that are printed or newspaper articles uh, by the civilians describing the aftermath and what it was like, like this um, quote from uh, Sarah Broadhead, not only were there soldiers killed in the battle, but there were horses everywhere. 
Right. Yeah. And I mean, we have uh, uh, so many of these photographs and, you know, coupled with the maps, you know, in some cases we can see a specific area of the battlefield and we have photographs of dead at that site. And here's one, Tim, right? We're looking here um, at the at a, the slaughter pen where we know on the Elliott burial map, there actually are Confederate graves indicated. So, yeah. And so it helps when you look at this um, burial map that we're going to talk about. Um, you know, looking at it and seeing temporary burials on the field, and then later knowing that some of the temporary burials that are shown are moved to the cemetery just a few months later, obviously the map is made from some early survey of graves on the battlefield. And although we, you know, debate about the accuracy at different points, by and large, it's pretty accurate. Right. Yeah. And, you know, here's another quote that one of my favorites, the dead lay scattered over the battlefield. Boy, like I wandered over the battlefield. Often I would see a blanket nearby, would go over and raise the same and would find a dead soldier there under who had turned black because of exposure. This is Hugh Ziegler who lived um, at what is now uh, the Lutheran Seminary building um, on Seminary Ridge. Um, so, you know, we have these graphic depictions. We have the, the, uh, the quotes uh, from civilians. Um, and we also have some newspaper articles. Here's one of my favorites uh, that was printed just a couple weeks after the battle, saying it must be known to the nation that not less than 3,000, and that's an understatement, men, uh, lie in and about Gettysburg in cornfields, wheat fields, meadows, and gardens by the wayside, and in the public road, buried hastily where they fell, and others in long rows with a piece of box lid or board of any kind with the name of the person and the day he died written with lead pencil, ink, or whatever they had to make a mark with. So, you know, with this incredible amount of, of uh, dead uh, in very shallow graves, in some cases uh, at different farms, there are limbs sticking up out of the shallow graves after a heavy rain. Um, it falls upon the people of Gettysburg to clean up um, and also to document uh, where these burials are located um, and the names, units, uh, ages, and any other information about the individuals that they can find. Um, and we have a few ideas of, of who's working on this at Gettysburg. Um, there's a local doctor named J.W.C. O'Neill um, who actually keeps notebooks uh, indicating where Confederate dead laid on the battlefield in these temporary graves. Um, and those notebooks are actually at the Adams County Historical Society today. Um, and uh, there was also a, a, a union, I can't remember the name, Tim, there was a union um, uh, list as well uh, that was created. <laughs> the Fry list, and, and that lists, especially at, at uh, field hospitals where the Union dead were buried. Um, and so we have these two notebooks, but uh, in terms of an actual survey of the field, um, that's where these maps come in, um, pairing the, the data about the soldiers to an actual specific location on the battlefield. Uh, so the, the task of, of all this recording and cleaning up and um, eventually establishing a national cemetery falls to David Wills, who's pictured here on the left. Uh, a prominent Gettysburg attorney, graduate of, of Pennsylvania College, now Gettysburg College. Um, and Wills begins a correspondence uh, with the governor of Pennsylvania at the time, Andrew Curtin, pictured on the right here. Um, and the two of them begin uh, to discuss uh, the arrangements for the burial of the Union dead. Um, and that is kind of the, the precursor to an association that's set up uh, to handle uh, the establishment of the National Cemetery and the reburial of the dead. Uh, important to note that largely African-American crews are responsible for moving the dead bodies of the Union dead from the battlefield to the National Cemetery. And we have incredible accounts of how uh, these folks who were involved uh, made every effort to dig through the pockets and, and find any other piece of identifying information uh, so that the body could be placed in an identified grave as opposed to the many unknown graves. I don't know, Tim, is there a number uh, of unknown graves in the National Cemetery that's typically given? Um, well, there's 979 unknown within the three unknown sections, totally unknown, but within the state sections themselves are unknown Massachusetts, unknown Pennsylvania. So I think we generally say somewhere around uh, 1,600 of the 3,500 known, uh, you know, graves in the cemetery are unknown. Right. So half of the northern soldiers in the cemetery are in unknown graves. Right. And it's clear, too, from these early accounts that we have about Wills that that he, uh, in addition to moving these bodies, is, is very interested in recording uh, where these temporary burials were um, so that the information could be matched up from the headboard 
uh, which was then, I believe, nailed to the top of the wooden coffin as it accompanied the body to the National Cemetery. Uh, but recording um, in the weeks that followed the battle exactly where everybody was located, Union and Confederate, uh, was something that we believe David Wills uh, was engaged with. And there are newspaper articles that back that up. And here is one of them. Um, here's an article from July 17th. Uh, saying that every arrangement has been made at Gettysburg by Governor Curtin for the removal upon application of David Wills of the bodies of Pennsylvanians killed in the late battle. And here's the really interesting sentence that helped us with this research to, that eventually led to finding the Elliott map of Antietam. A map has been made of the battlefield which shows the exact locality of every grave. Now keep in mind, this is a July 16th um, circular published July 17th. We're talking about less than two weeks after the battle um, and their newspapers are reporting that a map has already been made showing the exact location of every grave by David Wills and his associates. What an amazing feat that they had accomplished there. Um, and we, we think now without a doubt that the map that is commonly known as the Elliott burial map is based off of these original surveys, which we don't know if they exist anywhere, maybe perhaps in someone's attic. Um, of course, you all know about Lincoln's visit and the dedication of the cemetery in November. By that point, a majority of the dead had already been moved to the new National Cemetery, and that process was completed in February or March. Tim could probably give me the exact date <laughs> of 1864. Um, and so this process, uh, of course, does not include Confederate dead, which are left on the field for several years and then gradually removed to cemeteries throughout the South. Um, so who is the map maker? Um, we, Initially, you know, this project started because I was asked a question um, by my, my good friend Pete Carmichael uh, from the Civil War Institute. Uh, we were actually doing a live video and he asked me what the story was uh, with Elliot. Who was Elliot and why did he make this map? And I honestly couldn't answer the question. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I talked to Tim, I went back and consulted a bunch of books, some by my, my good friend William A. Frazzanito, uh, to try to figure out an answer to the question. Um, and I soon realized that there was no answer to the question. Uh, nobody knew who this S.G. Elliot was. And I thought that was strange given that the Elliot map is probably one of the most or more famous maps drawn of Gettysburg, certainly probably, uh, <laughs> certainly one of the most unique maps. Um, so I started digging uh, to find out who this guy is. And it turns out that S.G. Elliot was a surveyor uh, from New Hampshire who ended up moving to California in pursuit of the gold rush. Um, and we have this article here on the left showing um, an advertisement for Elliot, who was the county surveyor uh, in Auburn, California in 1858. Um, and then on the right is an article about Elliot uh, from 1863. Um, at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, um, instead of being here to record uh, this, these early surveys, as uh, some people had attributed to Elliot, he was actually engaged in a, a survey for a railroad between Northern California and Oregon. Then at some point during the survey, uh, Elliot got into a big disagreement uh, with the others on the, on the uh, expedition. He ends up abandoning the survey. He goes back uh, to San Francisco and reports to his superiors um, that this railroad survey is complete and that he's ready to go to Washington, D.C. to argue uh, for the merits uh, of the railroad before Congress and try to get a railroad bill passed that would uh, permit uh, this cross-state railroad to be placed. Um, so Elliot's nowhere near Gettysburg. Um, he's nowhere near the East Coast until January of 1864 when he arrived. And here, uh, this is not very exciting, uh, but here is another Elliot map that most of you probably have never seen. Uh, we know of three maps that Elliot made uh, that exist today. One of Gettysburg, one of Antietam, and this one of the Central California uh, Railroad. Um, it was published in 1860, and there is uh, S.G. Elliot's, uh, 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 not his signature, but a, a, a print. Um, under it. And it was published in Nevada um, in 1860. Uh, but of course, Elliot's much more famous for the later maps that he did um, of battlefields on the East Coast. Here's another article from 1864 um, discussing uh, Elliot and his trip to Washington. Um, he actually uh, got to Washington and began supposedly lobbying Congress for the passage of this bill. And this article states that uh, Mr. Elliot is urging the project forward as rapidly as possible and his whole energies are directed to this important measure. Um, evidently not though, because it's during this time that Elliot created these two maps. Um, so the first map is Gettysburg. Um, and this is actually a statement that was attached to the map by none other than David Wills. Another piece of evidence suggesting that Wills, um, these early surveys, uh, had been passed along to Elliot, um, who could not possibly have observed the battlefield in the state that it's shown in um, on this map. Um, 
So in terms of identifying Elliot as S.G. Elliot from California, these are two articles that actually say S.G. Elliot of California, while visiting the state, was induced by many personal friends to make an accurate survey of the ground. Uh, this is Gettysburg, of course. Uh, the same article on the left mentioning Elliot visited the battlefield of Gettysburg, and as a matter of curiosity, it occurred to him that an accurate map of the historical ground would be a source of public interest. Um, so these are the two articles that pin Elliot down as the California Elliot, um, which, uh, to my knowledge, the connection there had never been made. Um, again, his name's, his full name is Simon Green Elliott. Uh, he's a New Hampshire native who ends up in California and then ends up back on the East Coast. Um, so, Tim, why don't you talk a little bit about the different uh, versions of the Elliott map and, and where they're located today? So, uh, there are three different versions of the Elliott burial map of Gettysburg. And the one we're looking at here is uh, cut in half. Um, it's part of, uh, you know, two pages. And this is the Elliott burial map that most of the licensed battlefield guides are familiar with because this one is at the National Archives. And years ago, one of our colleagues actually made a copy of it and it was, you know, disseminated amongst the battlefield guides so that we could use it as a resource. Now, I guess in the 19... Um, uh, 30s or 40s, the National Park Service had also made uh, a copy of this. And so at the Gettysburg National Park, you know, they had a copy of this particular version of the Elliott burial map. But they're also, uh, here's the, the bottom half of that uh, particular Elliott burial map. There were two other versions of the Elliott burial map in the collections of the Library of Congress. And the maps are slightly different. And you can see um, uh, difference in color. One's, one's actually in color and one's kind of, um, you know, in black and white. Uh, there, basically, there's some minor differences between the maps, but they're basically, um, you know, the same done from the same survey. And uh, Andrew, actually, I guess the next slide is the three, oh, you wanted to mention one of the differences here. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly mention the on the colorized version, there is an early plan of the National Cemetery, uh, which is undoubtedly one of the first depictions of what the National Cemetery would, would look like, um, and uh, showing the various plots um, for each state, as well as uh, the unknown dead, which you can see to, on the right side uh, that Tim had already mentioned. Um, one thing we wanted to point out here is, so this is the Gettysburg Elliott map on the left and the Antietam Elliott map on the right. Um, and you can really see looking at them side by side that they are extremely similar um, in terms of the tick marks, in terms of the fonts, in terms of, of the circular text that's indicating uh, kind of a, a short history of what happened at that part of the field. Um, even down to the titles, uh, the map uh, from Gettysburg up on the left, uh, published by H.H. H. Lloyd and Company, the same is true for Antietam. Um, there's no evidence that these maps were ever sold in New York City. Um, in fact, Lloyd ran many advertisements but never advertised either of these maps. So we don't, that's an outstanding uh, mystery why these maps were never sold. There is some evidence that the map was sold in Philadelphia. Um, the map on the bottom, uh, which would have been uh, the non-colorized version, um, was, was uh, there was a lithograph, uh, uh, it was, there was a lithograph done in Philadelphia um, and that was likely sold uh, at a very small volume. Um, so there are some very subtle differences between the maps, but we know of, as Tim said, uh, the two maps um, at, the Nash, at the Library of Congress, uh, a map at the, the National Archives, and uh, the Antietam Elliott map on the right of your screen, which is at the New York Public Library, recently unearthed uh, by Tim. Um, and, and, you know, to mention the re whole purpose of my search for an Elliott burial map at the New York Public Library is because we knew that maps were supposedly printed in New York from S.G. Elliott. And also, um, I knew there were different versions of the map, and I wanted to see if I could find another version of the map in a public repository that confirmed which map was the one that was mass produced, or if I could find any that were actually printed uh, for public consumption. Right. Yeah, and here's, uh, for those of you who haven't really looked at the maps in detail, we've talked about how they show the burials on the battlefield, uh, but how exactly are they depicted? Uh, Union graves are shown as kind of a, a cross, and Confederate burials are shown as a just an independent slash mark. Uh, and then we have horses shown uh, with uh, kind of comma-looking figures. Um, 
And then uh, there is a little bit of a disparity of uh, the Gettysburg map on the left, the Antietam on the right, between how uh, cannons are shown um, and breastworks uh, are shown. But for the most part, the maps are almost identical um, in, in terms of how they're presented. Uh, so one major difference that, that Tim and I picked up on right away is the Gettysburg map, uh, which is shown here. Uh, we're looking at the Barlow Knoll section of the Gettysburg battlefield uh, on the Carlisle Pike. Um, and uh, on the Gettysburg map, there are only 18 of those tick marks uh, that are actually identified with the name of a soldier. Um, and we don't know why Elliot chose to identify just a few um, on the Gettysburg map, um, why he wouldn't just identify uh, none of them or only prominent you know, officers, uh, but it seems like he's identifying um, people uh, of all ranks and it's very random. At Gettysburg, mostly they're Confederates, uh, but at Gettysburg, uh, there are only in 18 um, individual marks that are labeled with a name. At Antietam, however, uh, there are over 50. And uh, here is a section of the Antietam map uh, showing some of the graves um, uh, that are that are identified by name. Um, at Antietam, there are many, many more Union graves identified. Um, and we think this might be because at Antietam, the Union dead remained on the battlefield uh, for much longer. At Gettysburg, they're only there for a few months before being re removed to the National Cemetery. So it's possible that the Gettysburg survey sung by Wills were not quite as detailed, um, or Elliot didn't want to identify graves that no longer existed. Um, so we're, we're not sure about that, but it's another inconsistency and makes the Antietam map really valuable. Another uh, difference that, that we picked up on is how horses are shown. On the Gettysburg map, the horses are scattered all around the battlefield. Um, there doesn't seem to be uh, any effort by the time the survey was done for the horses to be gathered together. Um, we know at Gettysburg they're gathered together and burned. I'm not sure if we know if that's the case at Antietam, but I would assume um, that it probably is. Um, so here's the Gettysburg map showing uh, the Trossel Farm and the Emmitsburg Road, the Peach Orchard, um, and you'll see all the dead horses, especially surrounding the Trossel Farm uh, that are indicated on the map. Um, and uh, at the Antietam site, you can see the horses have uh, been gathered together in piles. Um, and most of the Antietam map, uh, hold, it holds up where the, the horses are together um, in, in clusters as opposed to just scattered everywhere. It might again suggest that the Gettysburg map was made closer to the Battle of Gettysburg than the Antietam map was made to the Battle of Antietam. Um, but all evidence does suggest uh, that Elliot was copying surveys uh, that had been done by earlier uh, groups of individuals, especially at Gettysburg, but we think also at Antietam. Um, one really unique thing about Gettysburg, I don't know who first picked up on this, Tim, do you, you wanna tell this story? Oh, I, I think William Frasinita is the one who really liked to tell the story. Uh, uh, I don't know when he, first told us or if other people who had gotten copies of the map pick, picked it up. But there's a famous photograph here of Meade's headquarters and there's a horse in the middle of the road. And, um, you know, this particular photograph we believe is like, you know, taken on July 9th or July 10th. So, you know, some six or seven days after the battle is over and there's still a horse in the middle of the road. And of course, on the Elliott burial map, there's a horse shown in the middle of the road. So uh, that, had, that horse had to have been moved uh, at some early date. And it's interesting that he shows that same horse in the road on, um, you know, or a similar horse in the road on his burial map. Right, and it's more evidence that the, the surveys, you know, while in some cases there are areas, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, where there are problems with the map, uh, for the most part, there is, there's extreme accuracy, uh, especially when you count the dead uh, in places like Culp's Hill, which historian Bill Frasnito did, um, and compare that with the number of tick marks, and it aligns uh, almost exactly. Um, so it appears that these early surveys, for the most part, done by Wills and his crew, and then later uh, uh, copied by Elliot, are extraordinarily accurate um, and show the battlefield as it must have appeared within just a week or two after the battle. And on this particular map, um, since we have it up, if you look over to the left along the Emmitsburg Road, you can see that uh, 522 Confederate soldiers are shown in one long trench and 175 and 106. And of course, the 522, that's really high. But, you know, just those three numbers together, that's like uh, um, 800 Confederate soldiers that are buried on the east side of the Emmitsburg Road. And I mention this because 
there are people who have written books about Pickett's charge that sort of downplay the number of Southerners that crossed over the Emmitsburg Road. And they've tried to reduce the total number of Confederates that came up and over the stone wall and made it that far. And the Elliott burial map, you're not dragging dead soldiers over two fences and then burying them in a field. If, if that, if that met many dead died on the east of the Emmitsburg Road and you know, it doesn't show all the people that are wounded in the fight that actually were captured or made it back, a huge amount of Southerners came over that Emmitsburg Road. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to take now to thank the, uh, I think there's four or five folks who've donated tonight uh, to our video. We do really appreciate it. Um, uh, your donations help us continue to keep uh, historic documents and artifacts from Gettysburg and Adams County safe uh, and preserved. Um, thank you for that. And there is a match tonight up to $158, um, the same number of years that have passed since the Battle of Antietam, which is kind of the impetus for tonight's program, uh, the discovery of an Antietam burial map for Elliot. So thank you to those of you who donated, and uh, we'd really appreciate if you'd chip in a few dollars to help us continue to put these programs on. Um, so we wanted to talk about a few other places where the map uh, aligns pretty well with what we know about the Gettysburg battlefield. Um, one is uh, what's commonly referred to as Iverson's Pits, um, a place where uh, hundreds of Confederates perished on the first day of the battle during their attack on the afternoon of July 1st uh, against the Union First Corps on Oak Ridge. Um, Iverson's Brigade suffered devastating casualties, and you can see that here on the Elliott Burial map. Um, I think there's about 110 tick marks uh, in this small section. Um, and of course, a lot of Confederates were mortally wounded and taken back to field hospitals behind the lines. The same thing for, for Union soldiers, um, but more so for Confederates, I think. So the number of tick marks really um, is probably even greater um, than, than what is portrayed on the map. Another area that's, that's quite accurate is uh, the Herps Woods or Reynolds Woods section of the first day's field. Uh, there's about 155 Union graves uh, shown uh, where the Iron Brigade fell back through Herps Woods. I see our good friend Phil Spoggy is watching right now, so I hope he catches this because he is a big Iron Brigade buff. Um, so uh, another section of the map that we really like that's, that's, that's quite accurate. Um, you can see Confederate dead as well along Willoughby Run. Uh, where there were major Confederate attacks both on the morning and the afternoon of July 1st. Uh, many Confederates from North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama are killed along the banks of Willoughby's Run and buried uh, in graves on both sides uh, of the creek. Another really interesting thing, maybe Tim you could talk about this one, um, is there's an identified grave that's actually quite famous um, in the town of Gettysburg on the Elliott map. Yeah, it's uh, Sergeant Amos Humiston of the 154th New York and of course to just to make the story simple, he is the soldier who is unidentified after the battle. Um, a local citizen finds his body. Uh, they don't know who he is, but there's a photograph on his body of three children. Um, this uh, Gettysburg citizen is telling the story and a doctor overhears the story, um, obtains the photograph, is really enamored by the story of the unknown soldier, has copies of the photograph made and circulated. The guy has New York buttons on his jacket. They assume he's from New York. Eventually, a lady in a, um, Cataragus County, Portville, New York, I believe it is, uh, sees or learns of the photograph, goes to the newspaper office, sees the photograph of her three children, and of course, you know, realizes that you know, her husband, if she hadn't heard uh, before that had been killed in the fighting. Of course, Felinda Humiston brings her children to Gettysburg. Um, uh, they, they open up an orphanage for children whose fathers had died in the Civil War, whose um, mothers had all died of other causes. And for many years, there's an orphanage on the side of Cemetery Hill um, that is for the children of the Civil War. And um, what's interesting is, you know, Humiston was then buried in a marked grave in our Soldiers National Cemetery, and his children were able to visit their father's grave, something that they would not have been able to do had not the body been identified. But I wanted to point out, in this case, there's an 1867 photograph that actually taken by the Tysons on Stratton Street, looking down, looking north towards the railroad tracks, and it shows that um, uh, building that's just you know, in your circle, uh, as a uh, freight dupe, I think it's a William 
E. Biddle, W. E. Biddle is shown on the side of the building in the photograph, uh, and it's a warehouse for um, the railroad. And it says that Sergeant Humiston's body was found in that lot. I point this out because I, I just a few weeks ago, I saw someone on Facebook post a picture of a house on York Street and say that's where Humiston's body was found. But we always had pretty good evidence of exactly where the body was found. And today, not far from the spot where the body is shown, there is actually a memorial uh, placed by someone to uh, mark near the spot where um, Humiston's body was located. So this, in this case, this map confirms something that we know from other sources and we know uh, this placement is very accurate, but Humiston's body was moved to the National Cemetery and this map was not prepared until much later. So, um, you know, he's obviously getting that information from some earlier survey that he was given when he prepared this map. One other thing, Andrew, on this map, I should point out that the buildings in the town, they're not based on an original survey of the town that was done for this purpose. The buildings on the town here are laid out almost exactly as they are on the 1858 uh, wall map insert of the town. Uh, there are a few additions to that because I, I imagine whoever did it was conscious of the fact that um, north of the town, uh, there's a little more building shown. And so they added to it, but the base of these buildings is not original. It's from the 1858 uh, wall map. Right. Yeah, more evidence that, uh, you know, Elliot uh, plagiarized his work here at Gettysburg um, and likely at Antietam as well while he was in Washington, D.C. for a brief period of time uh, lobbying Congress uh, for a railroad bill. Um, another really interesting mistake on the Elliot map, and I'll let Tim talk about this too for a minute because he's kind of an expert here on this section of the battlefield, uh, but is the way that Elliot labels so many dead bodies um, on the Rose Farm and in Rose Woods. Now, Tim, there are quite a few actual burials at the Rose Farm, um, but what exactly about this portion of the map is, is exaggerated? Well, I'm, you know, the number of dead, rebel dead here, just exceed the number of rebel dead that could possibly be in that area. I, I think probably in some areas of the field, um, you know, the number of dead were overwhelming. And it's, it's interesting to me in these early surveys where he shows some of the Southern dead, um, you know, I understand they're going to move the northern dead to the cemetery, but it was, you know, not until years later they moved the southern dead from the battlefield. So, um, you know, are they really being that careful about how they're labeling the southern dead? And also, the dead were rolled into large trenches and buried all together, whereas more of the northern dead are buried in individual graves. So, did they just misread? Um, the, uh, you know, something that told you how many dead were buried in a certain place um, or an exaggerate just a little bit, but um, you can see he's trying to put hash marks um, in places where there are dead shown. And, and you know, um, um, I don't know how to scale the map is, but the lines drawn on the map are probably like, uh, you know, 15 feet long in actual scale. So, you know, if you're going to be more accurate to the size of a grave, make, he would have to make the hash marks a little bit smaller also. Well, I like it because it shows the farm buildings and some of the names of the farmers, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Right. Yeah, and it's an, another important thing to note is a lot of the dead bodies that we know uh, from photographs of the Gettysburg Battlefield are located right in this vicinity on the Rose Farm in the open fields here where, where he has so many dead uh, labeled. So clearly he's uh, labeling dead where there were dead, but the number is, is quite a bit inflated. Um, another really unique thing um, about the Elliott map that, that Tim and I picked up on is it's the only map that labels a certain farm on the battlefield that's left off of most maps. Um, and that is the farm owned by the Watts family. They were an African-American uh, family that came from Maryland uh, before the Civil War, ended up purchasing land here in Cumberland Township, and they own several acres here. Uh, actually, their descendants are, are very good friends of ours, the Nutters. I think uh, Jane might be watching, so a shout out to Jane and our good friends at the Gettysburg Black History Museum. Um, but the Watts Farm is shown on this map and on by name on no others. It's shown um, on one other map, but is unlabeled. And this sat roughly where the Longstreet Tower 
um, now stands on the Gettysburg battlefield. So important to remember that what is now Confederate Avenue, a pretty prominent stretch with several uh, monuments was owned by this African-American family uh, during the battle. And we're hoping to, to help uh, eventually to get a, uh, a marker put up here to commemorate uh, this family um, and their struggle uh, during the Civil War. Of, of course, the, there were two members of the Watts family that ended up serving in the United States Colored Troops, um, enlisting uh, after the Battle of Gettysburg. Lloyd Watts was a prominent uh, teacher, reverend, um, and community leader here in Gettysburg. But this farm existed um, right where that, or just about where the tower stands today. Of course, another uh, farm owned by the Warfield family, another uh, African-American family was just north of this site. Um, so this Watts label on this map seems to indicate that maybe Elliot had access um, to unique information, perhaps that Wills and his team had collected shortly after the battle, um, as this just really doesn't appear on anything else. Um, any other notes on, on that, Tim? Well, the farm itself is shown on the John Batchelder asymmetrical map of the battle, which was surveyed and drawn in late 1863 and published in like September of 1864, but the farm is not labeled by name. It's just shown on the map. And generally when a farm is not labeled by name and only shown, people kind of tend to forget about it. But by the Warren map survey, which was done in the fall of 1868 in the summer and fall of 1869, uh, that map, is, that farm is not shown. So that house probably disappeared uh, within five years after the battle. Right, yeah, it is. And we do have deeds and tax records that back up this information. And you can see there is a Confederate soldier buried just um, a few yards uh, south of the Watts farm. And then one other thing, just finally to point out is that it's one of the only maps that, that really labels um, Camp Letterman, uh, the hospital established east of Gettysburg um, that was in existence for weeks, uh, months really, following the Battle of Gettysburg. And you can see here uh, the, the tick marks for the Union and mostly Confederate dead um, that were buried at that hospital. Um, so the Elliott map um, of Gettysburg is a, a wonderful resource, but we're so fortunate to now have a second map um, of the battlefield of Antietam uh, done by Elliot, and we're excited to see what Antietam scholars are able to, to continue to learn uh, about the process uh, of creating that map and what it tells us about the aftermath of Antietam. Um, but the Gettysburg map, you know, thanks to, to our research and, and uh, being able to research uh, on digital archives like the New York Public Library, like newspapers.com, ancestry.com, uh, we were able to piece together this story uh, and share it with everyone. Uh, it's a wonderful story. Um, and now, uh, thanks to what we now know about the Gettysburg map, um, there's a lot more significance to Elliot's work here at Gettysburg because um, we believe that it's based off of a map now that was created by David Wills and his team within just two weeks of the battle. So when you look at things like the Elliott burial map, you're looking at one of the closest glimpses of the Battle of Gettysburg that you could possibly get, um, aside from the incredible photographs that we have of the dead on the field. Um, so we, we encourage you to, to look up both of these maps um, on the Library of Congress website. You can find the Gettysburg Elliott maps. It's Elliott with two Ts. Um, and uh, on the New York Public Library's digital collections uh, page, you can search for the Antietam Elliott map and you can explore these resources uh, for yourself. Um, so uh, that is a, a kind of a synopsis of our research and uh, we have to uh, give a hand to Tim for actually going to the New York Public Library site and unearthing this incredible uh, document. Um, you know, I, let me mention something about Danny Andrew because, um, uh, you know, 10 or, you know, even 10 years ago, um, digital research on the internet was not really what people had made it out to be. And, you know, I remember when I, you know, when people first started telling me, oh yeah, you can do research on the internet. And then I'd look, I was like, there's nothing on the internet. You can't find stuff on the internet. But over the last 10 years, there have been repositories that have made an effort. And of course, I've had some of it's through funding to digitize their collections. In the old days, if you wanted to find something, you had to go to the National Archives. You know, I remember if I wanted to look at a census record from somewhere else than the Adams County Historical Society, I had to go to a major repository that had the census record on microfilm. And now they're all available online. So they're incredible resources continually to be made uh, for 
researchers online in the New York Public Library had digitized their photograph collection, a large portion of it put it online like uh, you know seven years ago. And it's just fabulous. The first time it came up, you know, I, I just remember being astounded by some of the new photographs of the Civil War I was able to find. And now just a couple of years ago, this map digitization project that the library did allows you to actually find things in their archives without going to the repository and kudos to the people who have pushed for the digitization of these records. And it's happening at the National Archives and the Library of Congress and major repositories.